work workshop meeting. Uh, again, um, really appreciate the attendance tonight, especially uh, those members of our administrative team that will help us, you know, through the agenda. Um, you know, one of the things we're really trying to do with our workshop meetings is to um, really have the, the, the primary amount of or the bulk of the discussions on these items at the workshop meeting so our to aid in the, and facilitate a, a very a smooth uh, board voting meeting it's also the kind of meeting where we hope to have you know the participation of folks that's why it's so critical to have you know our administrative team you know, here and, and other members of the public here to really kind of weigh in on on, on items here as we go through and we have questions as a board. Um, so thank you all for, uh, for being here this evening. Um, also, before I forget, I just want to say to the rest of the board members that we will have an executive session following uh, this uh, board workshop for uh, <clears throat> legal purposes. Um, so I think this evening we'll start with a presentation I'm not mistaken. I, Dr. Sloffer, and, and I'm going to introduce Dr. Sloffer. Hello, sir. I don't know. Hit the button, please. Don't leave it for the camera. Hit the button, please. It'll turn green. All right. Good point. Check it out. There you go. Yep, you're good. Okay. Well, the interest of time. Okay. I know you guys have a lot of stuff going on tonight and, and later on. I think you had a chance to read everything I had written down in my, in my report. Um, I, I just want to highlight a few different things. First, I want to thank Dr. Phelps for allowing us to once again have our holiday concert. Of all the things on this, I want to highlight that because it was, it's, it's great. It's great PR for our school. It's great PR for, for everything that we do. Uh, we had 500, 600 people jammed in, in our cafeteria. In, uh, on a Thursday afternoon at 2 o'clock because it's important. And we were not permitted to do that for a while, and we had it for years, and then we were told we couldn't do it anymore. And I'm so glad, grateful that we're able to do it again. It means so much to our faculty, to our parents, to our kids. It's like, the, it's like one of the special days of the year in school. We were so happy to have it back again. So Dr. Phillips, thank you. And also, there's something not on my board report that I, I neglected to. To put on there, I, uh, I want to thank the board for sponsoring our e-mission. It's really cool if you guys ever want to come and see it. We do the e-mission in fourth grade, and we have them going on now. We used to just do one. We used to do one every uh, the fourth one fourth grade class would do it, then another fourth grade class. Now we have them all going on at one time, and it is really it's really a fun exercise for the fourth grade students. Learning experience. They work for about a month and a half or two months to prepare for it, and. Uh, it's it's a uh, it's you know science together and distance learning has all the all the things that really make it a fun exercise and rewarding for the students and very educational. So thank you, the school board for for uh, for sponsoring that. We appreciate it. Other than that, I think uh, everything kind of speaks for itself. Advice we raised forty over four thousand dollars for Trump Road for your heart and. Um, you know, I always quote the thing about our building climate because it's so important. It's it's such an important thing to do, um, and we all work together to do a, to do our best, and and we have a great environment, and you know, it's something that we all work at. It doesn't, it's like a good marriage. I know a lot about a good marriage, and and uh, that's what it takes. You got to work at it. I made it almost two years. I'll tell you that right now. <laughs> By the skin of my teeth, almost two years. Right anyway. Uh, other than that, you had everything, you had a chance to read everything. Is there any questions? Are there any questions or anything? Yes? Okay. Do, you, do you have on your like, verbal behavior classroom? Yes. Okay. We, I was just a little curious as to how that works or how, it's, how it's on. Like how the students get in there? Or are they in there? Well, the students are in there, they're, they're nonverbal for the most part. Oh, it's and not verbal. It's, it, it's, it's a nonverbal, uh, so we're teaching verbal behaviors. So we're teaching, you know, with, with uh, pictures. We're doing lots of different things, and a lot of uh, discrete trial and error. And uh, uh, yeah, it's very structured. It's still structured. There's a lot of autistic, su autistic support. Autistic support, okay. yes. Okay. It's kind of neat. If you want to come and see it, it's kind of neat. Yeah. There are a lot of adults in the room, and there's a lot of stuff going on. But it's uh, it's tedious. It's it, I really tip my hats off to them because it's. The little bits of the, the progress that they make 
is not quantity, you know, the gap is the gap. The kind of uh, progress a lot of our other teachers see. But they're so grateful for the progress that they do make, it's um, it's really rewarding for them. It's really self it's really intrinsic for them. For a staff. I was just curious about your um, your enrollment in kindergarten and, and activities you have going on for the students that are coming up. Activities for the students. Yeah, like um, an open house or I mean, what, well, we do, what we happens? Have, we have kindergarten visit. Okay. And then we also have um, the, the parents come and bring them for it for an hour. Everyone's scheduled. That's registered. Comes in May for the kindergarten visit. In May, you said. Yeah, we do okay. that. In I think that's I think we're May first. First and second, maybe right in there. That's right. Ms. Swan, do you want to discuss what goes on with the center? Yes, I know. I, I, I can talk about it as well. Well, you just replied to a sheet. Oh, okay. Is mm -hmm. it the same in all, all elementary? Yes. Oh, okay. Then never mind. I mean, if you. Go ahead. I don't know there, there is an event going on. We're, you'll be getting a connected uh, message. We'll be going out and as well as an email to our incoming kindergarten parents. Uh, because of grant money that we applied for this past year uh, through the Governor's Institute, uh, we've done a couple of things with trying to connect with our pre-K providers. But one of the things that we are doing is we are having and we're coupling with the spring into STEM night. Oh yeah, I got that. Well, well I, I saw it on Facebook. Yeah. Yeah, you probably saw it on Facebook. Yeah. It's already on our website as well. Um, and that invitation is going out to all of our incoming kindergarten children in the district. Uh, the first 100 children um, are receiving um, a really cool <laughs> backpack uh, that has our Exeter logo on it that says um, I'm an Exeter Eagle and there are all kinds of uh, school readiness supplies. It's a make and take workshop uh, that our teachers um, were organizing so there are all kinds of stations that the parents can take their child to that they'll engage in all kinds of readiness activities and then there's a make and take it portion for the children as well but we've also invited uh, some of our pre-k providers if they wanted to set up a table as well so we're expecting a really large outpouring of our incoming k students but also along with our spring into stem care which is always a huge and successful night and then so in may at each elementary level the kindergartners yeah. and their parents the pre-kindergartners um, with their parents for, for an hour? I, I meet with the parents for an hour and talk oh. about just what goes on in kindergarten. Okay. Snows and that's is the what same happens. date for every elementary no, school? No, we, we try to schedule so they're not on the same day. Oh, okay. But um, the last few years we've had some dates that overlap. But when I first started here, we used to have them. We did the pick dates. And then, um, you know, kindergarten for Exeter, um, it's full day, clearly, obviously. Um, and so do the kindergartners actually come on that first day of school for the full day? Yes. Or is it, or can they do? We, we have a, another, we have a uh, uh, new student orientation as well. Okay. That's in August, and that information comes out at the kindergarten visit. So they come back again in August? They come back in August, then they do a bus ride around the community, okay. try to get the bus on two wheels, and then take them off <laughs> a little bit. And, but, um, and then they come in and see their classroom. By that time, the teachers generally have their room set up. And a lot of times the teachers are in there, they can meet the teachers because in, in, in you know, in May, they yeah, obviously they have the class in there. Mm -hmm. Not only that, but yeah, we don't, exactly. Okay, thank you. Okay. Uh, two questions. Oh. Okay. Sorry. I just want to say, um, Pam Rockwell for Easter also, whereas I was at your school with Dr. Phillips when they did the Christmas Pam Rockwell, and that's just an awesome thing. I'm really to see you do it so we always get like one extra one for someone that's special with something you know someone came back from knee surgery and 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 not knee surgery with knee replacement and you know so we always look for some situation where there'll be one person in the hands or six dollars or whatever and um this year we had a, a psychologist who's brand new she was her first it was her first time she was so proud holding a hammer so now she said her friends didn't believe her her parents her parents her friends no one believed that she wanted this hammer so she's in my office and, and I, she's all the time. I'm taking pictures of her up on my phone. So she can send it to all her friends. And the next day she told me how, you know, her, her daughter was like so pumped to wish they could do that. We could do that at our school. Her sister daughter goes to school somewhere in the mountain. I think it's a, a great, great tradition. And, you know, I hope that that continues and maybe some other schools do it too. It's fun. It's fun. Uh, the two questions that I had uh, for the Spanish club. 
Um, I was wondering if you could kind of expand on uh, the effectiveness that the high school students have coming in to talk about uh, talk about Spanish, <laughs> speak Spanish and teach Spanish. Um, and I'm curious to find out if there are any other organizations or activities that are like that where the high school students or junior high students are coming down to spend time with the elementary students. Um, and then the other question that I had is, I think it might have been two years ago, where you had kind of stated that the observation techniques or forms that you had uh, for teacher observations were burdensome. And I was just wondering uh, what kind of um, uh, what kind of effort goes into the observations that you have left uh, that you're talking about in here, and um, if there's anything that the board or the administration can do to help you with that, okay. or help make it easier. So, so the Spanish uh, students, you know, it's it's we have a, a range of kindergarten to fourth grade, so we try to put the kids into you know like abilities and uh, based on what they can learn, and they're learning things like the months, they're learning the days, they're learning to count, they're learning different nouns, different kind of things. The high school kids love it. I mean, they can't wait to come here. It's 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 snowing. It's bitter cold. It's raining. The high school kids show up. They love it. Um, our our elementary school kids love it as well. We have one day to sign up. If you miss the sign up, that's it because we fill it up that first day, without question. It's like first come first serve. Uh, actually, we have to have a raffle to see who gets in because we can only accommodate like 25 students. So what they do and and the, what the high school students do is it's it's fun. And and at, at, at the end of the year. I mean, the parents want they want their kids in here. We get so many more kids that apply on that first day because they're waiting, you know, to apply. It's 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 neat. Um, we don't have anything else where the kids come back from high school except our co-op situations, and uh, we have pretty many this year. We have like four students that have been involved, like two right now, and, and two more that want to be involved in in cooperating, working working with teachers. So uh, that's as far as that goes. And and in the uh, observations. We kind of streamline some of the things in there. I know I streamlined some things. Maybe I was doing some things that I didn't need to do that would make it more cumbersome. So I've streamlined that process for me. It's much more doable right now. Yeah. And real quickly, um, during our budget meeting the other day, Patrick and, and Dr. Phillips and I were talking about that process and possibly evaluating in the future. So. Yeah, Thank you. Thank you, sir. I just have one question. Um, so at the last board meeting, we had approved uh, a request for bids for the chiller plant and piping work on your uh, school building, which we've heard a lot about over the last year, having issues of temperature control. Um, I just want to make sure we're fixing the right problem here. So, so with the decision that we made, I'm going to assume that by the start of the school year in September, we should be done with addressing those issues of classroom temperature because we have, I think there are two separate items there. There's the, the chiller acquisition, which I think we had to put in early because of what it takes to construct it. But when I was going through some of my notes from previous meetings, there was an issue around the temperature controls in the classrooms. So I'm just wondering if we're, you know, I would like us to know that at a September board meeting, you're not standing before us and telling us that you're having the same problems. Well, uh, it's a two-year plan. The, this summer, the chillers will be done. It will be brought inside to eliminate the issue for the pipes that burst last summer. Okay. The vents will, in the classrooms will all be fixed next summer. So it's a so two-year we'll program. Year of what issue then with the classroom <sighs> Some, yeah, it's okay. Yes. Yeah, it's, it's yes. So Hopefully we, we shouldn't expect that it's going to be solved this year. No. no. Okay. No. Can I? Sure. Sure. Mr. Sure. Sure. Yeah, when, uh, when the design phase came for the HVAC upgrade to Jackson Hall, um, obviously KCBA did the best they could with their initial inspections, but as as that program developed, I expressed concerns to Ed Mangold saying, you know, with the, the replacement of the major equipment uh, is not going to solve all the problems over there. And they took that into account. I gave them all my HVAC related work orders from Jackson Wall so they could take that information and see where the problem areas were. So they did identify that. Uh, in the original plan, they had a three-year phased-out program of replacing the individual unit vents in the classrooms. They obviously saw after the information we provided to them that that needed to be pushed up 
to the process. Now, uh, and I can, I can, just, I can, excuse me, just, I don't understand. So the venting was like, instead of three years, they wanted to move it up into the second year? Yes, okay. yes. And uh, there's a reason which I won't go into the technicalities because I don't even understand all of them, but uh, in order to properly replace the unit vents so that they improve the air quality and provide humidity control and things that we don't have with the current system, they need to put the heart in place first. They need to do the chiller and the, and the, and the boiler. And then once they can do that, because it's gonna require different venting, uh, I believe the, the plan for the new unit vents is, is that they're going to get their fresh air intake from a central system instead of per unit, which causes problems a lot of the times with, with the unit calling in and bringing fresh air in from outside, cold air, basically. So it would be an improvement on that system where it would run more efficiently, humidity control on this, but in order to get to that stage, you have to do the, the central heart first. Good. Any other questions? Thank you, sir. I'll try to be brief, okay? I just, I just wanted to thank Dr. Swamper, as well as all the um, principals who hosted the um, uh, the board and the central office uh, representatives at the uh, faculty uh, forum that we had uh, at uh, at all the schools. Um, you know, we continue to feel that uh, there's benefit. Uh, you know, it varies in terms of uh, faculty attendance uh, to some degree, but uh, you know, it's I think it's in some ways symbolic of our effort to try to remain open, to try to 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 be, um, you know, uh, thoughtful in terms of, uh, you know, how we interact with staff and, and try to, as much as possible, kind of show, up, show our, our staff members that we uh, are there to listen and learn from them. So thanks for all of you. <clears throat> uh, our next uh, discussion item is, is uh, Mrs. Guidish, and we're going to be talking a little bit about the installment payment of real estate taxes. Mr. Yellow. You want me to take it? Okay, so um, what happened is at the, the last business committee meeting, we heard from both of the tax collectors. And the tax collector from St. Lawrence, Susan Edgar, asked if it was a possibility that we could take the tax payment system from three up to four because she had a number of people, I believe the number was 28, who asked to have uh, a little more time to pay their taxes without getting a penalty thrown on. Now, since everybody seemed to think that that, that couldn't be done, um, the, the penalty portion, can we find a way to give these people extra time to pay their taxes? Ultimately, is what the question was. Uh, and currently, for the rest of the board, uh, the installments are due July 31st, September 15th, and October 31st. And I believe of the 28 or 29 at St. Lawrence, you're right, some of them have requested more time. Uh, and Charlie Diamond, the tax collector of Exeter, indicated that making it four uh, would cause a lot more work. But I had a conversation with him this past Friday, and when we were together, he actually called one of his fellow tax collectors from the Muhlenberg school, school District and said they have their final installment in November. Um, um, Charlie would be okay with three? Uh, four. Four. Three, changing it from October to November. Okay, so that's not four, or that's just that's not four. Moving that's the three, three, the next one back. Right. So, so that was that was the secondary that Sue asked me about. Right. Was if we could change that third one to give them more time if we can't go to four. Right, and I spoke with Susan today and she uh, said that that would help them, giving them another month to uh, make their final payment would be, would be helpful to them. Uh, just to give you some perspective, uh, 29 uh, installment payers in St. Lawrence is about $68,000. 
consider a township is about 350, uh, and that's about 1.28 million. So, and our resolution that was adopted back in 2012 also allows businesses to opt for installments. But our numbers for installment, uh, people who choose that option, are, are consistent. I don't see that we would let, you know, get into an issue where more would opt for installment. Most of our taxpayers pay in a discount period. So I would have to consult with our solicitor uh, to make changes to the resolution uh, if the board would want to move ahead. You know, I haven't had a chance to talk to them about this, but it's my understanding that the board can change their mind about the installment payments, but within the, the law. Um, but again, you know, Muhlenberg does something similar, so I'll move ahead and talk with uh, St. Stephen's to make sure we're, we're good and then bring it back. I mean, it would have to be done before June. Um, probably May would be a good month if you wanted to act upon it. Okay. And do Thoughts? you have do you have any concerns about cash flow at all? It doesn't sound like there should be, but I think it's worth asking. No, I don't. And again, if, if something uh, would change or the number would change uh, drastically, which I doubt, you know, it could be a one-year thing and we could always change it back. But I, the numbers have been consistent uh, year after year. And it's really just you know, these people at St. Lawrence who have asked for a couple years now. Mm -hmm. We think it would be easier for them. So, Ann, how about what percentage of our taxpayers pay for their taxes by, is it August 31st? Uh, for when you get to get the 2% percent discount? Pardon, I'm sorry? In the high 80%, close to probably 88% to 90%. They're in extra. Right, and obviously you have a lot of mortgage companies at escrow, mm -hmm. and you know, that's a big part of it, but the majority do pay <clears throat> in this kind of period. I'm fine with it. Do we want to advance it? Does anyone have any uh, concerns about um, moving this uh, forward to uh, the agenda for a, a vote, I suppose. Like, do we just do it on a temporary basis and see what it yields for us versus you know, making a wholesale change? Let's see what it looks like in year one, and if it doesn't, we just go back. Yeah. We, we typically right. meet with them annually, don't we, with the, do. the tax collectors, so that would be an opportunity for us to kind of review and uh, and re reconsider. So are we okay with it if it appears on May? So we'll go to the solicitor, get the resolution redone, and come back on in May. Excellent. Excellent. Chooses. Excellent. Okay. The proposal, just to be clear, is moving the final month of collections from October to November, right? That's what we yes. asked yes. the, the end of November, I believe? Yes. Yes. Okay. Yep. Anything more with that, or all done with that? That's good. Thank you. So, so and when they do that, they do, they do not get a discount. They they pay the the they regular the they they pay the regular rate without the discount without the two percent. Yeah. <clears throat> okay. Uh, we'll move to our next uh, section, which is uh, public comments. Any members of the audience invited to uh, make comments to the board? Any topics on the agenda or for the good of the district? Seeing none, uh, we'll move on to uh, the rest of the agenda, which uh, we have two sets of minutes that we'll be considering for um, uh, approval next Tuesday. Um, so if anyone has any, in the meantime, has any, any comments or concerns in the upcoming weeks, you know, let us know so we can modify those if necessary. Um, item six is board policies. Uh, we have some areas here that I know we've had some, some folks have expressed some questions or concerns, so 
I want to get into that a little bit. Um, policy 201 is admission of students, and this was actually a policy that we had held off on a little bit and had some additional um, discussion about, particularly the early admission to kindergarten, early admission to first grade, and thank you for you know making some of those changes, Sue. And um, the only thing I would say is that let's just make sure that we include those administrative regulations in that policy it, you know, when it gets posted, uh, once it's approved. Yeah, we'll put them on there once it's passed. Once it's passed, okay, great. I mean, are they ready to go? Yeah, They're completed. Uh, oh, great, okay. And, and you know, again, you know, for the benefit of the board, I mean, these administrative regulations are not subject to board approval, uh, but we certainly like to know what they include, and in this particular case, you know, the issue really has to do with a, a sort of real clear understanding of, of the criteria for early admission to first grade and kindergarten, and making sure that parents are aware of that, those that have interests in, 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 in being considered. Mm -hmm. Any yeah. other discussions on policy 201? Dr. Hamburger, um, is it, as I'm becoming more um, experienced in these last few months with, um, <clears throat> excuse me, reading policies um, and, and understanding them, is it necessary for us to see those administrative regulations before approving policy, even though we're not making changes to them, but it's part of the policy. So I'm having, I'm, I'm having a, you know, a little bit of a moral uh, issue with approving the policy, but I don't know what, where the administrative regulations stand. Well, that will create a real problem for us because we probably have 50% of these policies that require administrative regulations as a, as a part of it. They, it, they basically, you know, add flesh to the bones. They they provide uh, further detail and information in regard to how a particular policy is going to be implemented from implemented from an administrative point of view. So, you know, the general guidance is provided by the policy, but the administrative regulations provide the detail. Um, but I I hear what you're saying, but it, it it it's often not practical. In this particular case, though, if we have it available, we, I think it is. You know, we do have. We're within the time frame. They've already been established, so they can be distributed to the board, you know, before the voting meeting Tuesday, so you can see them. Okay. So if if you don't mind sending those out to the uh, to the board, so that they can see that as well. Again, not for a vote, but and not for your comment necessarily, but just for your uh, clarification. Just as a question. Uh, when we're writing the administrative regulations, is that an immediate response to a policy passing, or are they almost written congruently uh, when we're going through the process of drafting a policy? It depends. No. <laughs> yeah, I would say ideally it's nice to have it as soon as possible after the passing, but it, realistically, it takes time. You know, and you know, one of the things that Dr. Phillips has said is that you know we have some time and breaks in the schedule and I, and this, I think you mentioned the summer might the be a good time work for our administrators to really to dig into the the regulations portion but if you actually do a search on these policies you'll see many many policies yeah working. now we do have a PSPA service for administrative regulations so that should make the process yeah. go a little bit and we have those as well so we're referencing them as we go through and, and again as we've said through the policies they've been vetted already as administrative regs yeah. we just need to put our spin on them so the administration have been looking at them we're, Long. Okay, so it, it varies depending on the policy. Yes. Okay. Yeah, some policies do not require a right? Yeah. No, no, no. It varies on the policy, as in sometimes you'll write them with the policy, sometimes you'll write them afterwards, and sometimes. So, some, sometimes it's sometimes just, it's just, it's just like almost, I don't want to say rubber stamp, but the administrative regs fit for the policy. Okay. Other times we need to do our own spin on it, so the administration has to collaborate. Okay. Yeah, I, I, I think even more so than the policy. The administrative regulations are subject to modification at the local level. Policies tend to be more driven by, as we've talked about, you know, legislation, school code, existing statute, and you know, in this particular case, I mean, with administrative reg uh, regulations, it, it can be customized to whatever the school district does, and it could vary from district to district. Mm -hmm. um, the other policies that now are up for second reading, the weapons policy, I didn't hear any comments or questions about that, so that's up for, um, that's up for uh, approval. Um, terrorist threats, there was some uh, effort to kind of align um, the PSBA numbering system, so that was incorporated into that. and. Um, there's some language deleted from that existing policy, but uh, I didn't hear any comments on terroristic threats. 
I just uh, related to that. Uh, in that policy, it references a memorandum of understanding with the Exeter Township Police Department. Do we know how often we uh, review and execute on that policy or that memorandum? Well, uh, that should be done annually. I didn't say that's an annual, plus we have a new policy now, so we have to readdress it anyway. Okay. Yeah, and, and you'll see that reference to that memorandum of understanding in several of the policies, uh, particularly the ones that have to do with you know, any of, any of the um, issues of weapons, threats, um, could even be um, tobacco um, searches. They all, they all may have a reference to that memorandum of understanding. And it pretty much indicates, yeah, that, that memo pretty much indicates that anytime there is a significant violation that one of our primary responsibilities is to immediately reach out to local law enforcement to let them know, you know what's happening and, and to see whether or not they would have jurisdiction in a particular case. Do we have a similar memorandum of understanding with the Central Burbs Police Department, uh, specifically for the administration building? I don't believe so. I don't believe that's for the administration building. They, I said that we don't. I don't believe the administration building is covered under the MOU for the policy because we don't have students per se. We do have students over there. So that's probably something we should look at. That's a good question. Yeah, that's probably something we should look at because of the. Um, or the, do they have the MOU as the school, as the school entity? No, the current would have to fall under the school. Right. So, I don't understand that, but as the school entity, since they sort of contract from us, are they the holder of the MOU? True. So then we, we should we should look into that. That's a good point. We should look into an understanding with with uh, Central Berks as well. Um, so, weapons, terroristic threats, student complaint process, didn't really hear from any anyone in terms of any concerns about that, dress and grooming, um, moving on to tobacco, uh, 222, uh, let's go to the first reading, yeah, it's first reading, oh, I'm sorry, that's supposed to be first reading. Yeah, it has to be moved to first reading because it's going to be substantive change, we have to add. We'll, we'll move that to first reading. One of the things about that was that our current policy refers, and I had spoken to Bill Kane about this uh, today, and uh, kind of brought this up as, as I was kind of making a final read of this. Um, electronic cigarettes are included in our current um, policy, 222, uh, it's being prohibited. And it's very detailed um, and very specific language related to that. That was completely eliminated in the, um, in the draft policy, uh, which in a sense would have probably open the door to whether or not that was that, that would actually be a violation of our tobacco policy uh, without being explicit. But I looked at the notes from PSPA, they had eliminated it because they felt that it was understood that that um, that e-cigarettes are, are, are a tobacco product, which they're really not. Um, so um, the suggestion was, and I, I totally agree, and Bill, I, you're welcome to comment on this because we had that conversation today. Um, you know, the e-cigarettes, I believe, should be kept in the policy, and we should we should take the language of the prior policy yeah. and, and move it into the um, to the revised policy. What do you, what are your thoughts, Bill? Yeah. One of the concerns, uh, Mr. Dean, the first one when I was talking about this after uh, Dr. Hamburg and I communicated through email a few times today. One of the concerns is that we have a lot of parents who are basically armchair lawyers, if it's not explicitly stated, they're going to argue, well, no, the policy doesn't prohibit bait, for, for example. Um, and there are there are differences between cigarettes under Pennsylvania law and bait. Pennsylvania law prohibits, you know, the use of cigarettes in public place. It does not prohibit the use of bait, bait pens and, and you know, the various things. So there, there's a legal distinction between the two. So, you know, so we can't. I, I don't think we can safely assume. Well, whatever we think about tobacco also covers the base devices. That we should be specific, as we were in the current in the existing policy. So you're recommending adding in the old language? Yes. Right, we can do that. Yes. Does that, does that include you're saying e-cigarettes? And correct me. E-cigarettes the same thing as vapes? And yeah. I know yeah, um, I so. jewels yeah. and all those new devices that are becoming. Issues. I mean, will that are e-cigarettes the umbrella of those? Is that enough language, or do we need to spell it, each one out? 
the, the language that's in the current policy, not, not one being proposed, but the existing one is very comprehensive. Okay. It covers all the possibilities. So, Juul is a vape? It is. So that's Which covered. is just a form of an e-cigarette. Okay, and that's a form of an e-cigarette. Now, I guess, Bill, my only question, too, is while you're, while you're up here. Um, there are um, punitive consequences for to tobacco and as part of statute. Um, but I'm, I'm wondering whether or not the punitive financial consequences would also relate to vape as well, or, or is, would that be a separate consequence, let's say? That's a good question. Those, those financial consequences are based on the, the ability to cite or the law, and probably something we should talk to the uh, district manager about to get a, to get a ruling on that. Yeah, or maybe our, our legal counsel can yeah. give us an opinion on that. So. This is going to go back to first reading, so we have another month before we even reconsider it again. So uh, we'll make the, the modifications to it for this time, but we'll see also if we can get an update on on that aspect of it with uh, you know with the, the punitive aspect and the fine for for use. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Um, so that was uh, 222, and that'll move back to first reading for next week. Uh, 805 is emergency preparedness. I have no concerns about that. Um, I'd just like to mention two things on sure. that. Yeah. Um, the plan itself doesn't reference Burke's emergency management, and I think that we probably should at least make sure that whatever plan that we're putting in place, the way this stuff typically unfolds with an EP situation, is it rolls from local to county and state and federal and we should be in touch with Brian Gottshaw at um, Burke's Emergency Management as part of that process. Um, that's number one. Number two. So you're, are you looking under authority, or the language of authority here, Mike? Uh, wherever, wherever Pima's indicated, we should have BEMA in there as well. It's called BEMA? Burke's Emergency Management, Department of Emergency Services, DES. Contact is Brian Gottshaw. The other thing is, since it's in here, I'll ask the question, how are we on the date of April 10th with our um, uh, drills that we're supposed to have? Looks like they're all supposed to be conducted by April 10th. Do we know if we did that? Well, that's in this proposed policy, so I don't know whether it's an old policy or not. This is a new policy. So the April 10th is a new date? The, the, I don't believe in there was even a date from the old policy. This is a new policy, so yes, it would have to be a a new date, but I would believe principals, we've been doing the monthly reports for the, all the different Our drills and so forth and trainings that we've been doing. Okay. Yeah, you know, I would say, Mike, that, that that April 10th date is not an arbitrary day. That was that's established in school code. Uh, school code. Um, no, so, I'm fine with it. I just wanted yeah. to know if we actually have done what is written in school code. It's April 10th. That's yeah. what I'm asking. Mm -hmm. Good question. Uh, the other thing, uh, if you look in that policy, uh, there are some discretionary. Um, uh, op there are some options at the very bottom of the policy that talk about continuity of student learning and core operations during uh, times of when um, the district may be shut down for emergency purposes. They talk about, um, we may, um, it said the district shall make provisions in the emergency preparedness plan for the continuity of student learning during school closings and excessive absences. Such alternatives may include web-based district instruction, telephone trees, mailed uh, lessons and assignments, instruction via local television or radio stations. Um, you know, the way this is designed is that districts have the option to select one or all or none of those provisions. And, you know, do we... We, we, are, current, we'll we are currently looking into the virtual programs, the so, web-based. So, I mean, should we eliminate two, three, and four in this thing and then just stick, stick with web-based uh, direct instruction? Well, I mean, eliminating options, I think we can always leave ourselves open, but I think the one we're looking at right now is the, the virtual option. We, we had started a conversation at the uh, intermediate unit with some other districts. We're looking into that option okay. as the uh, primary. 
Yeah, and I, mean, I think the you know the important word is may. So yes. if we do keep those in there, I mean that's, that's another option. options. Okay, so we'll keep those in there. Yeah, know. but just so the board knows, it's the virtual option that we're looking at. The okay. Flexible. All right. Instruction. Okay. Um, any any other comments about? Uh, I was just under delegation of responsibility. Um, Superintendent or designee shall implement a communication system to notify parents slash guardians of the evacuation of students and to alert the entire school community when necessary. In the event, say like, you know, what happened in February, um, it wasn't our school, but does this include also sending out notification or communication um, in a timely manner to say, you know, um, I, you know, we're aware of what's going on and, and our school is safe and we're taking, you know, we have this emergency plan in place or that's not part of this policy. No, you're right, Parkland. Yes. Yeah, we, we, that would not be something that we would immediately respond to, but we did send things out after that starting right. the process, yes. So that's, that's not a policy, that was just kind of, you know, feeling of... Uh, More of our administrative regulations. Okay, that, okay. All right, thanks. Any other comments on this policy? Okay, uh, the next policy we will probably want to talk a little bit about is the use of motor vehicles. And I know there was some language in the proposed policy that had a limit or that had um, uh, um, restricted the use of uh, motorcycles, skateboards, and is it, uh, mini bikes or scooters? I think scooters, scooters, something like that. Yeah. So, um, you know, I, I know we had, I know there was some concern expressed, and, and I think you mentioned that um, this may have been a, uh, a, a provision in, you know, with our insurance, um, or, may, or maybe that's what PSBA said, maybe something was popular to, to eliminate because of insurance and liability issues. Well, back in 2011-12, our worker uh, comp program was eliminated from the policy of Thank you. Yes. Uh, that uh, we have a, would not allow employees to use their motorcycle when they're conducting business during the day, school business. Uh, and that really is for reasons of safety because um, they are hard to see, uh, they're hard to move during bad weather. So that was a worker comp. But then my comment when Dr. Miller asked me about how, what I knew was that I suspected that this policy, PSBA, included that now for those same reasons for liability because from the perspective that uh, you know, it can be dangerous to travel on a skateboard uh, when, you, when you have a lot of buses, you know, dismissal and, uh, and those bikes, motorbikes or scooters being just difficult to see. So I was just offering my uh, feedback based on what our worker prompt and Anne, I did the same thing. That's how I know the policy number. I haven't written down. I didn't memorize it. Um, you know, I was trying to search why that was the language as well, or why they were putting that in. And yeah, motorcycle usage for employees does state exactly like you said that um, those smaller modes of transportation are hard to see, um, and and therefore could be dangerous with the bigger transportation. So um, again, I, I saw your email and kind of was like, yeah, that's what I got too. As a clarification, is it a requirement under our current worker compensation plan that we prohibit the use of motorcycles, fire faculty and staff, or is that a recommendation for whatever policy reason? that they can't use it during the work day? Yeah, but is, but is that a requirement of our worker compensation plan? It was strongly recommended, strongly. Does that affect our rate if we well, one thing is this is it would if an accident would occur, you know, uh, we yeah, had a couple of employees who would yeah. use their motorcycle to go to the hardware store or, and it's dangerous and they, uh, we were trying to get our uh, claims under control. Mm -hmm. So it was a very strong recommendation. Yeah. Well, can I just say that, that this is outside of the scope of this policy? Well, and, and the reason I ask that is because I think along with what this has done to alarm, I think, several board members, I think 810.5 is also, in my opinion, a little bit ridiculous, um, personally. Now, 
I'm curious to hear those answers. And part of my recommendation apart from saying that this provision should be struck was revisiting 810.5, because I think that too, in line with this, in my opinion, just isn't appropriate. All right. <laughs> um, I was trying to come up with the correct word to describe how I felt about this. Um, and I think ridiculous is a wonderful word. Um, it says right in here that um, if you know that motor vehicle or motorcycles um, are difficult to handle. I ride a motorcycle. I don't find it difficult to handle. Um, it says especially in bad weather. Name a vehicle that's not difficult to handle in bad weather, especially if you're not a good driver. Um, I think it's discriminatory to say that they can't, you can ride your motorcycle to work, but you can't ride it during lunchtime or to go and get something. And I think that it's silly not to allow them on the property. Um, I feel that, um, well, and I asked everyone on the board, you know, what's the definition of a mini bike? And no one responded back to me. Um, a mini bike is something completely different than a motorcycle. A motorcycle requires that you take a class um, it requires that you have it insured, you have it registered, just like a car. You're doing everything else according to the law to be able to ride that bike that you would to drive a car. Um, you know, going back to the weather, I don't know of any parent that's going to let their child ride a motorcycle if it's snowing. So that kind of takes care of that issue right there. Um, if we're concerned about parking and um, leaving when things are congested, then why don't we designate a space where they can safely park their motorcycle so they can get to school and safely leave without being stuck in that congestion and then you don't have to worry again about other cars possibly hitting them you know don't have them park with everyone else um yeah i just I, I don't like this at all i think that there should be no reason why you can't have a motorcycle on the premises i as a child was picked up happily from jackson elementary school on a motorcycle and nothing ever happened to me I'm still here yeah, just to let you know, you asked me to reach out to PSBA to ask them about this. Um, PSBA said it was similarly what Ann said was just a liability piece, but it's all purely the board's decision. It's a recommendation, but it's a purely the board can take out one of them, they can take out the whole thing. It's purely up to the board for what they want to do. So it was just a suggestion. It's just a suggestion because of liability. And it wasn't in our prior policy. It was not in our prior policy. This would, this would be a change for us. Mm -hmm. I wonder if we were to do that. Um, I'm wondering from the secondary folks, you know, uh, who have maybe have kids who are currently driving or riding vehicles uh, such as these to school. Do we have this situation that's happening right now? I'm other than Mr. Japina, is there anybody that rides a, those kind of vehicles to school? Students? Students, yeah. Do you find, Mr. Kane, do you find you have any problems with motorcycles, mini bikes, scooters, or skateboards? <coughs> Oh, no, I mean, we've had we had problems with I don't know if they're called these were called mini bikes, but uh, motorized bicycles. Okay. Where students have put you know, the pens in front of them themselves. Mm -hmm. The police have some issues with that, and they actually have to be licensed mm -hmm. and insured just like motorcycles. So they have to have a license plate. Mm -hmm. So if it doesn't, that's yeah. that's a different that's a police yeah. issue, right? But, we, but back to the original question, we have those students. Have, have we ever? Not in my country. Really? Huh. Interesting. <laughs> well, and I think I think in the policy it states that it's the parents' responsibility, and it, if I remember correctly, it takes the way of the district having liability. Um, correct. Yeah, I mean, I, I think it's under purpose, the very first statement, it says an assumption of responsibility by parents and guardians and students right, so, for yeah, safety to and from school. Students um, students as an assumption of responsibility by parents, guardians, and students, yeah. yeah. So is that, is, you know, the word assumptions not a good word to have in there? But going back to legality, you know, can we... I would, I would think we'd want to stick to the, the big issue really right. is, um, you know, do we want to include a prohibition <laughs> of skateboards, mini bikes, and motorcycles on school property? And I, I'm getting a sense from the board here that, you know, we'd like to keep the policy maybe where So it says the board shall not be responsible for motor vehicles that are lost, stolen, damaged, 
and then bold or for injuries arising from their use. Mm -hmm. So does that take away the liability? I mean, I, I, my only assumption is that, that it's the insurance industry's concern that somebody would be more inclined to be hurt on a mini bike, skateboard, or motorcycle than in a car. And that's why this, hence the suggestion, but uh, I don't think that necessarily increases our, does that increase our liability in any way? When we assume that parents are responsible, guardians are responsible for the student travel back and forth to school, as long as they're using a, you know, properly licensed uh, and registered vehicle, I, I don't see the, and it does say that they have to have um, they have to be granted permission by the building principal to drive to drive period on school grounds. So whether it's a car, you know, they need a parking permit, correct? Yeah, but well, we right. wouldn't discriminate. Uh, correct, but I'm just right. saying we would have we would know. You know, yeah. we would and, know. And under liability matters, why would it be any different for skateboards, mini bikes, and bicycles and uh, motorcycles as opposed to a bike? What difference is there between a bicycle and then these other three things? It's just that more people tend to use them. And I think that that's really an example where this is purposely looking at these things as different than all the others when really they're not. You have to have a license to drive two of them and kids bring uh, skateboard in their backpacks or in some other bag all the time so that they can hang out with their friends after school. Yeah, the one thing that surprised me is that, that uh, skateboards are considered uh, a motor vehicle. Yeah. <laughs> you can't park the skateboard. It's really a parking permit, right? Yeah. I, I still think we need to look more into the definition of mini bike because my understanding is that that is not a licensed, registered, insured vehicle. And so therefore, I see a problem with that. And if I could add to that, uh, Michelle, it's a good point. Uh, as I was reading through, uh, you know, I had emailed Dave and um, it, you know, I know my, my son who has a dirt bike was riding in a neighborhood and, you know, got called out by a neighbor, not the police. And my understanding is that dirt bikes, to ride them in residential areas, have to be street legal, um, which includes the, the license plate, the headlight, the, you know, those kinds of things. And so, whereas it's understood that if you're going to ride, uh, ride a motorcycle, that those things are in place. You know, if we put the mini bike piece in, we may want to add a phrase, you know, phrase along the lines of that it be street legal or define what, you know, parameters it would need to have if we're going to allow children to drive them to school. So, you know, to, to your point. I agree, because some dirt bikes you can ride on the street and some you can't. There, there's different types of tires for that. And then the other thing is, um, like scooters, depending on what size CC it is, you need a license and some you don't. Um, and then the other thing with skateboards is, I'm just curious, what, what this, you're saying, we're saying that skateboards was never in here because I just happened to notice at Watton Creek the other day, there's a sign that says skateboards prohibited at Watton Creek. So if they were never prohibited, there's a sign that says they are prohibited on that property. So I don't know, were they prohibited before? Well, I, I kind of think that some of those signs are put up because they're just, sometimes they're used destructively, you know, they can, they can damage, you know, they're used improperly. They can damage them when kids are there oh unsupervised. Okay. No, they, they may use it in, in ways that uh, have an impact. But, I mean, to, as, as we talked about, the, the, the uh, elimination of skateboards from all property doesn't make any sense, but if it's posted as no skateboards, then there's a reason for that, and they should follow the posting requirement. But it does, I don't know where that necessarily means it has to be in our policy. I think that the policy is titled Use of Motor Vehicles. I, I, don't, I definitely, regardless of the other... The, the line itself, I mean, I think the line itself needs to go amongst the other board members, but skateboards does not seem like it fits in that uh, in that policy mm -hmm. to begin with. And I don't know where it would be, maybe modes of transportation or something like that. But I could see skateboards becoming a little bit more of an issue because you don't park them, you're not going to get a parking permit, and you have to carry it around with you at school or if there's a drop-off. Um, and they, that can become a distraction <coughs> during the, in the learning environments. So, so, uh, Ms. Pink, do you see a lot of students, Ms. Pink, do a lot of students ride their skateboards to school? Do you, do you have that? We have a school? few. They ride them through school and they pick them up and put them in their locker and they pay for them. Sometimes they'll ask us to store them in the office. Right, because right, this morning I was driving down 13th Street hmm. near the school and there was a student 
weaving and riding a skateboard and there were buses and a lot of cars. It looked very dangerous to me. And I was really, you know, being very cautious because he was kind of, you know, just flying along with a skateboard. And so that just reminded me that, it, you know, I think it is dangerous. And then I guess just one more, I was just a chemistry in high school. So then from what Michelle said about there being signs, at a lot in Creek, but they're clearly not at the high school. It's in Louisville, right? So does, it, does that make it contradictory? Should it be across the board? Or is that a building level decision? Well, I mean, as I said before, we've got a lot of properties. And, you know, I think, you know, if it's posted at a building site, it's posted primarily just to kind of, like for instance, if somebody brought a skateboard into a, an area that was not necessarily directly attached to a the school building on a set or an area that's posted, then I think it would be acceptable. I can say what's going on right now is, is what they're doing, especially out the back, I can see them in my office and I have to go out and say, guys, you can't be here. They're riding the skateboards up along the brick and just destroying the brick. And I don't know, I mean, to me it's, it's scary because if they fall, they're gonna break the neck too. But it's just when they ride up and they kind of ride along the edges, they're chipping off on the brick. So I'm assuming that's what the prohibition is for. That's why I'm close to that damage to the property. But I don't, I don't think it necessarily has to be in this policy, is what I'm saying, in order for that to be enforced. If, it's, if there's signage and, it's, and if it's visible and, and uh, it's clear. So um, I'm getting the sense that, Pat, did you want to say something? Yeah, I was just going to say, I'm not really for having um, like small motorized things like a bike or a scooter. Uh, in the, on the property because I think that um, with, with the big buses that we have, uh, sometimes, you know, when they're back, I mean, I, I've been there where they, the, the buses are coming out and coming in and, and they're fast and furious because they gotta, they gotta make things uh, on time. And, you know, I, I, I fear it's a liability for the district, um, you know, if something would happen, um, you know, and, who could say whose fault it was, and uh, you know we could be on the hook for you know a big lawsuit if someone got killed, and just because they wanted to ride a bike to school or wanted to ride a scooter to school, it was motorized. So I, I, I'm going to I'm going to be for this call. So you, we, have, we have one person so far well, from hearing from the school zone. I also wanted to say, and I put this out when this policy came up for review. Um, I wondered if there was, and Dr. Miller, maybe you have any insight on this. Um, any or noise ordinance for this, um, the loudness that can potentially be, now I'm not saying they're all like that, but potentially be in some motor motorcycles, um, and would that be an obstruction of crossing guards or bus drivers talking to their their, their students or something like that? That was my only other no concern of why that language would be in there. Yeah, I have no idea about the noise ordinance. Is there a noise ordinance? I have no, no idea. Okay. Hunter, you can see that. We used to start up our race cars at my dad's business on 422 and never got yelled at, so we were okay. Um, in regards to your comment, Pat, I would say that someone could be walking behind a bus, not on a motorcycle, and get hit by a bus, and we could have a liability problem. I think it goes back to if we're going to allow motorcycles, which I strongly feel that we should, maybe we should have a safe place for them to park, that they're not near buses and they're not near other cars that are leaving. Um, especially if it's junior high, if you have kids at that age that are driving, um, I don't know if there are. Um, but I know that is a, a particularly, or for teachers then, you know, that's a particularly um, small area where I could see safety arising, and I would want them to have the right to be able to drive them if they would like to, but I'd like them to be safe. Okay. Um, so I'm, again, trying to get mm -hmm. a sense of, you know, of the support for eliminating this uh, portion of the policy uh, reflecting on the prohibition of these, of these uh, vehicles. Um, does anybody other than Pat have a concern about eliminating or about the, removing that language? Well, I would ask someone to look in t to talk to our insurance company concerning if we are going to allow these vehicles on uh, on our property, you know, every day in and out. That is, it going to increase our our cost of uh, uh, of to the to the policy.
um, we don't have any problems. And I'm, I'm at, you know, I mean, our, our current sorry. policy is, is silent on this okay. right and, now. Yeah. So we, and, and it seems as if we, this hasn't been an issue. So right. this, is, this is an issue because it's been introduced as new language, and that's the extent of the issue right now. So I, I don't think it's a bad idea to check with our insurance if you're willing to, to do that. And, and, and we'll also get this vetted again by our solicitor just to make sure we're not overlooking anything. And then this will be on the agenda for first reading um, Tuesday, which means we still have. Just removing the language of the appropriation. Yes. Yeah. We're, we're moving the language, but it'll be, it'll be for first reading. And in the meantime, we'll, we'll do some checking and we'll have some clarification in terms of what this potential impact might be on insurance and from a legal perspective, if we have any concerns about potential liability. So I have a question. Why would the why would the amount change? Because we currently allow them. So what's there to check? Right? We currently allow motorcycles, so we're not changing anything. We might reduce it. Uh -huh. <laughs> That's my good point. Yeah, I mean, I think, I think there's a reason why PSBA kind of included it, which was that it's probably um, maybe somewhat of an acceptable notion that it represents a risk. You know, but. There'll be no cost asking. Yeah, we can always ask. Um, Listen, right in, in, in light of Ann going back um, to find out about that question, depending on the answer, could we consider re-looking at 810.5? Because I think that that's also an issue. Well, we're going to get to 810.5 at some point, <laughs> probably in two years. But, yeah. <laughs> Okay, well thanks, we'll move on if that's okay with everybody. Um, the other remaining policies, uh, care school properties, um, searches, um, any comments or concerns on any of those? Uh, Absolutely. Um, okay, Jerry. On 226. Which is searches. I, I'm not a fan of this language that says, uh, and I'm quoting it, during the time uh, prohibiting any behavior or action during the time spent traveling to and from school and to and from school-sponsored activities. That's really a big overreach into a person's personal freedom. And, and I, I mean, I understand being able to, or being allowed to regulate what happens here, but you can't regulate what happens on the way. When they are where are their buses, they are our students. But it says personal vehicles as well. On it our says, property? No, it says to and from school, be it in a Exeter vehicle or not. Yeah. I, can I just respond to that? Because I, I believe, and I may, I may be wrong this for it, you know, I think we may have to check with our solicitor, but uh, our responsibility starts from the time they leave their home. To the time they come to school, regardless of how they choose to come to travel. So we do have um, in local parents role when it comes to that period of time. From the time they leave their doorstep to the time they go back into their home, we have we have some level of responsibility there. Uh, so I, I, I believe that's where it's applicable. Okay, well then you have to go back to you have to go back to the other policy uh, concerning vehicles when you, when you were saying parents assuming responsibility in the motor vehicles, then it falls under the same umbrella, does it not? Well, I mean, I, I think if, if we assume responsibility, that means that we would take on their insurance uh, and the insurance liability for their travel, which, you know, clearly we're not going to do that. But I mean, in terms of their behavior and their comportment and their safe, you know, passage, from home and to, from home to school, I think that's where the law uh, extends our responsibility. Um, and again, I'm speaking from not I'm not an attorney, so I can't say, but that's my that's my understanding of our our responsibility. Mm -hmm. We'll get that in place. But we, we should get that in place. Okay. There was also um, in two twenty six. That's two twenty seven. Yes, searches. Yeah. The board authorizes the administration to conduct searches of students for their belongings, including lockers, automobiles, electronic devices, purses, backpacks, clothing, and other possessions, based on nothing but reasonable suspicion. Now, if you've got reasonable suspicion, sit on the kid, call the cops, get a warrant, and search him then. But don't violate his rights 
I mean, it's, it's just, it's wrong to violate a person's constitutional rights in that way. It, it, reasonable suspicion is the standard for school, for school districts. And I know we have a lesser standard uh, than law enforcement that has a higher standard, you know, for a search. Um, I know that to be true. So if we were to bring in law enforcement, they would need to have a warrant, or present a warrant, but they would have to have, um, I, I would suppose, probable cause, which is a higher standard. It's pretty much common practice in, in, in schools. Um, so I mean, it's like you know, like uh, the, the expectation of privacy in a locker, and even even privacy for your, your car. Um, it's not the same. You don't have the same rights as, as your public citizen might have uh, because of the conditions under which they've been given the privilege to ride their car there, and the and the privilege to use a locker that doesn't that they don't own. So those are the prevailing arguments from the legal side of it, from my recollection. And uh, we, we have a lot of concern about safety in schools, and so sometimes it might become necessary we want to keep the school safe and students safe. So sometimes searches are done for that reason. And, and so, you know. Okay, well I bring that up because- I think we need a lower level of being able to search. Well I bring it up because it happened to my son when he was in uh, 12th grade. Uh, a teacher thought she smelled something on him, and they they made him empty his pockets. They made him empty his book bag. They went out and looked at his car. They found nothing. There was absolutely no reason for the search. Okay, I asked him point blank, "My kid didn't do drugs. He walked by somebody. Maybe the smell got on him, but they used that to search him." And I didn't find about it find out about it until afterwards. Believe me, I wrote the new one to everybody involved. But it's a uh, it's a concern for me that that such a low level exists, and I, I get the current climate of fear that we're living in, and safety is important. But you know, people's rights have to mean something. I'm, I'm going to be the devil's advocate. So back there, my kids are young yet, but if my child was in high school and the teacher thought and had good reason to think that my child was doing drugs, and I didn't think that, and they searched him and found something, I would be in harm, because now I know and I can help my child. So I could see in the moment that would be very, um, you know, upsetting to your son, and, and I'm sorry that that happened, and I'm glad that they found nothing, but for the child that they might find something, and the child that that might help, I think that it's well worth it, and the other kids that it, you know, may help in, uh, depending on what it is that they find. But th that's more of the argument that's going on in the entire country as the wireless, uh, or rather warrantless searches of, of, of computers, of, of cell phones. And I, I just, I, I, I couldn't disagree with that more either. Um, if you have reasonable suspicion that you think it's going to go to that level, just go right to it. Get it over with. But don't violate the person's rights. I, and I think our secondary principles deal with this, you know, these issues all the time. And so this is a policy that they'll need to, to adhere to. Um, and uh, I know, you know they were very careful about not uh, not exceeding the limits of, of um, what is legally acceptable for searches. And it happens, I don't know how regularly Bill and Jason, you, you guys deal with this all the time, but I'm not sure how frequently you have to do searches. Maybe you can elaborate to some degree on what your history has been and what your practice is. It is, it is fairly frequent, to be honest with you, uh, because it's the only way that we can work on the drug problem that our school, just like every high school in the country, has. Um, I think you really do need to consult legal counsel on this because the courts have time and again upheld the reasonable suspicion premise. And I think you really need, you know, rather than arguing in circles here this evening, probably consult legal counsel and get some definitive information. Yeah. Well, I, I don't think there's any, I mean, I don't think, I think Jerry's debating it, I think, from um, his particular perspective. You know, mm -hmm. uh, I don't want to spend money on lawyers on this. No. Yeah. <laughs> right. I mean, th these policies have already been vetted, um, uh, obviously, by. PSBA counsel and 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 will receive the attention of our attorney as well. So 
if, it, if it's in violation of any any current law, case law, statute law, we'll find out. Well, I would say the Plessy versus Ferguson was vetted really well, too. They don't always get it right. Okay. Um, any other comments about searches? Yeah, I'd like to. Yeah. I, I thought I read in the paper that the um, Exeter Police Department has now gotten a canine dog that, that can do, can do uh, drug sure. searches. So I guess we could possibly then have have that uh, the, the dogs come in and check to see if there are. Well, um, on a, on a, a building basis, yes. This policy is on an individual basis. Oh, that's on an individual yeah, basis? Yeah, they're not going to come out for every time we have a student we want to search. Oh, okay. But they could do they could do a, a, a search. A, a search through the building. Mr. K, have, have we done that before where we've had the dog go through the building? Yeah. Yes. Yeah. So that, that's something we can do. But this is not, this policy wouldn't allow us to call the dog out for every time we, we see a student. Yeah, no, I, I, I was talking about just a... a yes, we, we do, we've currently done. Okay. Okay. Um, anything else? Okay. Searches, no, Okay, uh, controlled substances, 227. You know, essentially our drug, uh, drug and alcohol policy. Uh, student government and student fundraising. Um, those are the all up for first three. Yes. Um, on the student government, and maybe Mr. Kane or uh, Mr. Isselman or Mr. Dean might be better to answer this question, but do we currently have any bylaws, uh, constitution, uh, policies that the student council has adopted that we we'll need to readopt and or reapprove if this were to be approved? I, I would have to check with the student council. Okay. I guess I also. I'm curious to find out how often we really recognize the student council as the actual voice of the students when it comes to matters within the district. Uh, it certainly wasn't the case when I was there. I can remember because I ran on that platform. <laughs> um, so I wonder, is there more that we can be doing to include the students, especially in light of this policy, if we're going to recognize them as the formal voice? Is there more that we can do, and this is a general question that doesn't need to be answered tonight, but is there more that we can do to involve them in some of the decision making? Not so much that they get a vote at the table, but at least that they get a voice at the table. Yeah, I, I would just say some districts do um, have a student representative sit at the board table, as you're saying, and offer their insights and input when requested, but they'll vote. So it's not a, you know, it's, it's a recognized practice. Uh, among some of the words, and it may even be, we have to look at the triple zero section of our policy, it may be included there as an option for, um, for the district to, to do. Yeah. I just want to say I support that decision 100%. I think it'd be nice to have a student up here and hear their perspective. They're living these policies every day. Just look into that a little bit. So. Um, I, I do think that's a good idea. I know uh, in Reading, they, they, I mean, I remember attending many board meetings in Reading, school district, since I was an employee there, and they did have a, a representative to, to the board from the student body. Of course, they didn't go into a whole lot of things, but they kind of told us what was going on in the schools and, you know, gave us some insight, uh, you know, into, um, you know, the feel of what was going on with the students in the school. I think I think it would also be an excellent opportunity to allow some students to feel uh, encouraged because they are consulted in this process. I think we really saw some success when we were looking through the walkout and how we attended uh, the student forum um, with them really feeling like they had a serious seat at the table uh, because I know it wasn't the same in every district. Uh, it really. Um, <laughs> In addition to that, I think it's also a unique opportunity to bring up a new generation that is very concerned and interested with what goes on in meetings like this. I can remember many meetings that, and probably still most of them, where I am the youngest person in the room, um, and I think it would be far more encouraging for the rest of us to see a lot more people here together than I can remember. Okay. Sounds good. So we'll, we'll look into that. Thank you. Okay, that's, um, I think that's all for policy. 
Um, we're going to move on to business functions. Mr. Bell. Thank you. In uh, next week's voting meeting, we will be voting on accepting the audits of both tax collectors, Exeter and St. Lawrence, as well as disposal of elementary student desks and chairs. The CISPA agreement concerning the TIPS program, Teachers in the Parks, and uh, budget transfers. Speaking of um, tips, in the uh, tips in the parks, or what are they called? Teachers in the parks. Teachers in the parks, not tips in the parks. Teachers in the parks. Um, do we have, are we going to be donating again to the teachers in the parks as far as a, a monetary amount? We have a contract. You know, that's on the, yeah, that's, that's the item on the agenda that we're going to so, so is it the same as last year? Or exactly, I think it's exactly the same. So. Same amount. Yeah, same amount and same same contract, same language. Oh, okay. It right. should function pretty much the same. Okay, cool. Thank you. What is new from the other month? Is it the same? Is it twenty five thousand? Twenty five thousand. I just had a question uh, you know, about um, the elementary student desks and chairs, <laughs> and I, I just wondered if we could also maybe consider looking into the possibility of an auction service. I did speak with Wagner Auction Services today, mm -hmm. and they did some they did similar um, work for Amberg and Schuylkill Valley School Districts, and they would be receptive to coming in and looking at our inventory and seeing if they can give us a, a competitive um, offer, you know, on, on the service of auctioning off the material. And they would do it on site here. They would, wouldn't require taking it anywhere. So they would, if after your first email and my reply to you, um, my reply basically is, I'm under a lot of pressure to get this done, to get that gym uh, cleaned out. Uh, but I did speak with uh, Dick, his last name, I called him again, okay. and he actually did return the call, and uh, he did uh, an auction for Kutztown in 2015, so he too is willing, um, but he also indicated, and I did give him the I'm sure he didn't get a chance to see that, you know, those type, types of auctions are uh, effective when you have a variety of things, so, I mean, I can rework this language, but and then try to get him in, um, or, you know, to include both options. I'm really concerned about getting these desks and right. chairs out of the gym. Yeah. Because I, of the wrestling mats. But we have a lot of things out in the buildings that, uh, and I can talk with Wagner as well, but it seems like who I talk to and Wagner are very similar, where they, they'll do it on site, uh, and they could either do everything for you and they would take a, a bigger cut, or, would organize parts, but uh, I, I really don't want to um, obviously throw away things. So uh, if we aren't successful in getting rid of too many of those student desks and chairs by offering to the community, I know there are families that hey, for three dollars for a desk and chair, you know, they would really like that. And what was on the left, going in and bundling into a auction and the gentleman I spoke with said you know I could take a look at what you have he does have auction houses if it's not a lot he would be able to move it out of here yeah we have a lot um, yeah, my only and I I'm fine with all those I mm -hmm. my only concern is, is throwing into a landfill a lot of potentially useful right. And, and so, so we can avoid that at all costs. That would be my my biggest right, problem. Right, not re that and take away and discard. Um, you know, if it's broken, obviously you discard, but we'll make right. every attempt at doing what's in the best interest. Um, okay. Getting it somewhere else. Thank you. Is that all, um, Mr. Dahl, for this? Yes, sir, it is. Okay. So we'll move on to our personnel committee with Mr. Trapin. So we have four issues here. We have uh, uh, 
two retirements, uh, certificate of staff, Cheryl A. Straight from Jacksonville, who's been here for many, many, many years. Jasmine's wow. kindergarten teacher, first grade teacher. <laughs> and Pat Bender. We have appointments of support staff as a uh, part-time bus aide and a guest teacher. We have course requests. I'm a little laggy here today, Joe. <laughs> it's a little laggy. We need some high-speed internet in here. Go fix the internet, Joe. <laughs> After you do the calendar. And staff conferences. That's it. I have one question, um, and uh, Dr. Phillips, maybe you can uh, put some insight into this in a staff conference. There is one for uh, an AP Studio Art portfolio course. As I understood this, this is the training to be able to teach an AP class. Is that correct? Correct. So my concern here was that this is not a course that's been approved under the Soaring Eagle, and I wonder if we're putting ourselves up into a path dependency to almost approve that course before we've even gotten the chance to approve it. No, not from what I just reviewed. I've reviewed for studio art, for honor studio art, and then academic studio art. Yeah, the, the AP Art Studio, AP Art History is in Soaring Eagle. That's right. AP Art Studio is one that they are planning to propose for next year's Soaring Eagle. Okay. Um, so my concern is we're putting ourselves on a path dependency already here. Uh, because we have not approved next year's course catalog, and yet we're already paying for the conference to enable the teacher to teach that class. If we're going to approve the course, that's okay. That's when they should be going to the staff conference, in my opinion. So I'm a little bit concerned with this one. So my understanding is that there is a need for this course based on all the students that want to take the AP course. There's an interest in it. There's an interest in it. If we were to wait for the Soaring Eagle to be approved next year, it would be an additional year for this testing. So we'd be talking 2021, correct, for it to start. Because it'd be 1920 for the Soaring Eagle and then the, te the AP um, course training would take place 2021. Well, well, hopefully we can get the training in the summer. True, but I think the question from, from Mr. Ahrens is, he would rather have the course approved next year and then send the teacher to training, correct? Yeah, it can be done. So we'd be talking time. another two years. No, if, if the course were approved, let's say next March, the teacher could compete in- Oh, I see what you're saying. So you try to get it, if, is it typically March, offered every the summer? Could still be, yes. Okay, so then- Get trained and then be ready to teach it for- that, that, that we can certainly, we can certainly table yeah, us if that's good. the issues of the board. The only thing I would add to that conversation is that um, AP trainings are, are not easy to find. And one of the reasons why the cost is a little bit higher is that for whatever reason, and I experienced this where I was previously, there aren't a lot of places in PA that do AP training. I don't know why that is. But <clears throat> Delaware is a common location. I've had to send teachers to the Midwest before. And mm -hmm. so, and, you know, and I mean, I, it just it, it would be unfortunate if you know let's say we wait we, you know, we, approve, we approve it and then let's say next summer the training is not available I, I would hope that's not the case um, and you know we should you know I, I, I could probably look on the college board and see what that likelihood is but that would be that would be my only potential I, I agree that it, sorry the, the other comment I'd like to make is being trained in the AP course is an integral part of being able to write the curriculum for that course. That's true too. So my, uh, I, I don't disagree that I wouldn't want to force uh, the cost to be higher because we have to send them somewhere else or that it would take more time in the summer to write the curriculum. My concern here is that this is a course that's going to require new textbooks to be bought, uh, new materials to be made available to the students who take this course. Uh, and we're setting ourselves up to already approve a course that we have not yet approved by sending somebody to go do the course so that they're able to teach it. I think that this is out of process. We don't know what next year is gonna look like. 
and setting ourselves up on this path dependency, I think it's what we've done on several occasions where we vote for things after they've already occurred. And to me, I think that this is halfway down that road. And I think, you know, and I, I don't, I don't want to put uh, the teacher in this case in the situation to hear back from the board, no, we're not doing this this year. Um, but I, I think that this is premature. And I would prefer to see this done next year with the Soaring Eagle. And if we want to continue the conversation early to make sure that all the board is aware that this is going to be something that we're going to be voting on next year, I'm okay with that. Uh, but I think that this uh, this is not the time for this. That's that's my perspective. Only other thing I would mention, Hunter, is that I, if we allow the teacher to get the training this summer, I think the only message that sends is, you know, we're investing in your desire to want to, you know, be able to teach and teach AP art courses and offer them to the students. You know, once once you're AP certified and you have that certification, you have the certification. Um, and so, I, I mean, I think it, you know, I think it sends a message that we, you know, value that um, to the teacher. But I understand what you're saying process-wise. I mean, we can, I mean, we can do it either way. It just depends on, on what direction the board wants to go, or, or how you want to represent it. Yeah, my comment is, I mean, I, you know, I, I don't, um, I don't have a problem with delaying it. But what resonated for me was the idea that uh, maybe Phil brought it up, which is that by taking the course, it gives you preparation for writing curriculum that would then would be implemented. Um, you know, and, and if you were to, if we were to wait for next summer, then it really wouldn't be maybe sufficient time to do the ordering and, the, and, 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 and everything associated with writing curriculum in preparation for the start of the school year. I mean, I don't know. I, I, I can see what you're saying. I'm just, I don't know whether this necessarily commits us to a path. Um, we still have to approve, you know, the sort of, you know, we still have to approve the, the curriculum or the course, um, but I, I'm I'm trying to be sensitive to the to the need timing wise to for curriculum writing and development. So I mean, do we keep this on the agenda and then we can folks can vote against it if they want to? I don't know where it goes. But, uh, well, I, I agree with Hunter on this one. Um, I guess I need more information too. This is not a course we're not offering. We're not. It's not being offered right now. Um, in preparation and, and paying about fifteen hundred dollars for a teacher to get certified or you know get the AP certification, uh, how many students are taking this course? And AP Studio Art, I mean, it's definitely it should be you know students should have that opportunity if, if it arises, but it seems like it's a very select course. In, in addition to that, Mr. Kane, is there a reason why they didn't ask for this course to be added this year to the Soaring Eagle? <laughs> yeah, because they were late. Well, what was the, why didn't they ask for the staff request, uh, the staff conference this year then? Is there a reason that the timing didn't work out this year? Yes, because they were putting in the new AP Art History course this year. One AP course is difficult enough to handle the first year. Try to put in a second one. Can that same teacher who teaches, maybe this is the same teacher that is certified in the AP his, Art History can teach also AP Art Studio? A different AP certification. I mean, obviously, it is, it's a different it is course. A different but AP certification. It is different. Yes. Well, I know when you have an AP course um, and you take it as a student, if you're going to be an art major, that is a that uh, is another feather in your hat as you go to college, and and, it, and increases their, um, their 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 credits. So, I think um, Exeter has a great uh, our program here, and there is no reason why we have to wait a year uh, to get a teacher certified, because if she is certified and she's teaching a course, and who knows, she might, you know, she might give the kids a few um, pointers who are learning, you know, go on into college and are now seniors. So, you know, I, 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 I see no reason why we should not approve this course now. Well, Pat, I think some of the soft benefits that you identified in, in understanding what coursework is going to look like in college, uh, what the curriculum may look like, and also just general tips about how to be successful as an art major are things that our art teachers are already capable of doing. Uh, in addition to that, I also think, again, what it sounded like was that you're already to, ready to approve this course as something that's already set up for next year, and, and we haven't gotten to that point. 
and I, I'm, I'm just uncomfortable in doing business in this process where we're putting uh, the cart before the shoe. Shoe or the shoe? You know what I meant. You know what I meant. Mr. Mr. King, well, do, we, uh, do we know um, what level of interest there is in one person's premature decision and another one's strategic planning year? So is there some sense that there's a heightened interest and you anticipate that a number of kids are um, highly interested in the uh, course offering? I, I don't know the numbers right now. I could look at, we have a non-AP studio or art course now. I could go back and see what the requests are for that for next year. To give you some indication. Yeah, that's the best indication I can think of at this point. Because the students taking the art take the art studio would be the likely candidates for an AP art studio. So my request would that be that this be removed, but that's that's me. I see both sides of it, and I really like the way Hunter's thinking here to do things in a sequential manner to make sure that you're not putting the cart before the shoe, <laughs> so that you get things done right. It, it, it makes perfect sense. So, yeah. what, what? How would they get things wrong the way they're doing it now? If, if someone gets certified to be a, the AP instructor, if the course doesn't get approved, why wouldn't it get approved once you have the instructor? You have two kids that want to. Well, teach you. you're speaking to his point. Just because we have an instructor, we have to have that course. What if some other course comes up, and and let's let's say our budget goes to hell next year. So the economy just goes boom. It has nothing to do with, with the person being certified. Sure it does. Well, you already paid it, so you don't have to worry about next year. That's budget. the point. The money can be used elsewhere. Oh, come on. No, look. There might be special ed, or there might be uh, an additional classroom or a teacher that needs to be put in the budget. Well, you know, a lot of people uh, stay in school because they love art, just like a lot of people stay in school because they love music. You know, a lot of people stay in school because they love a certain subject. Uh, I'm sure there are um, many people here, kids that are in the art program, that are staying in school because they love art and, and they see it as a passion. I, I certainly agree with that point, Pat, and I don't think any of us are suggesting that we want to take away from the art program. I think we're, we're really looking for the process behind this decision, and I, I totally agree with you. Uh, in fact, for me, you know, social studies was what really made me want to come to school, and I, I wouldn't want to take that away from somebody who's coming to school for art. There are a lot of kids who do. Yeah, but what about the, the students that struggle in school that drop out? I mean, we can balance both of those. We need, we need, well, we're um, talking about people dropping out of school. I know, but the, it's great to have a passion and come, and they're good at something, but what about if we need, I'm saying if, if next year we need to incorporate a course, or a teacher, or a program that's going to require funding, uh, or from our budget, we might say, unfortunately, we're not going to be able to approve an AP Studio Art course because we need a remedial reading course for students that are struggling. Ooh, That's what I'm saying. Here's another item uh, to consider as well. And I, I, I think maybe we've gone too far into depth with this, but one thing that had caught my eye when I first looked at the Soren Day book as I thought of this. But now that has caught my eye even more is that we already have two courses for dual enrollment through Reading Area Community College for Fine Arts Studio, Art 111 and Art 121. So I'm curious about even the, the need then. And I, I, I think that that would be better place to have that discussion when the full course comes up for approval. I did. I don't think it would work. I don't think it needs to go to a vote. Well, not here. Well, right, we can, I mean next week. Yeah, next so week. I mean, one, and one thing I think we can, uh, just in concurring with uh, Dr. Phillips, one thing that we would try to do maybe is to provide any additional insights or information to the board uh, prior to the vote uh, next uh, Tuesday. Yeah, we can certainly get numbers, as Mr. King had, uh, indicated, mm -hmm. and we can also uh, revisit the process and why there's a need to get this done prior, you know, hence the, the curriculum writing and so forth, and bring that to the board. Uh, I'll go on the AP College Board website and see if there are standard trainings that are offered every summer. <coughs> I appreciate that. understand likely to whether and or not it'll be offered again. So are we, I'm sorry, are we going to bisect that out? As, as yes. Like a separate yes. Okay. We'll make a separate. We'll 
And I just want to say that you mentioned the two art classes that are doing well, but that's very different than the art portfolio. I you mean from, an, from the AP course? Or yeah, they, this is, this is art, um, the portfolio. You mentioned fine arts and something else for doing enrollment. Yeah, so the fine arts. Right, but that, the port, our portfolio is a whole different course. And when students are applying for art school, they ha they submit portfolio. But they have that course, it's just not AP now. Yeah. yeah, and it's an honors course right now, too. Um, so, so I understand what you're saying. My point was if we're worrying about cost of college associated with students, we already have two courses that satisfy that desire. So this, I think, has a higher burden to carry for why we would want to add this course, and I think that discussion hasn't occurred yet. So just to clarify, for a dual enrollment course, the parents have to pay the college tuition. Mm -hmm. okay. So if the student wants to take an AP course, they have to pay for it, or Pardon? take the test. If the student wants to take an AP test after their course, and I'm paying for the course, they just have to pay for the test. $84 for the test, $300 for the tuition. No, don't the school district, uh, when, they, if they, when they evaluate the overall high school, doesn't the more AP courses that they offer their students, isn't that a plus for the district? I think I read that somewhere. <coughs> it is part of the SPT calculation yes. for high schools, mm -hmm. yes, that's correct. So I, I suggest that we, when we have students interested in AP courses, and there's enough of them, then I think we should go forward and not force around. Okay, we're going to move on. <laughs> <laughs> we're going to and we're going to move to item nine, student functions. Mm -hmm. Mrs. Um, at the voting meeting next week, we're going to be reporting on the below field trips that are within a 60 mile radius. We're going to be voting on field trips that are beyond the 60 mile radius, and we're going to be voting on the approval of the Act E. I have one question. Sure. Um, on the, uh, the beyond 60 mile radius, number two. Senior high yearbook staff traveling to Harrisburg on April 25th. Is that not something that can be done virtually? No. Or is that a must trap? It, it cannot be done virtually. They work with the designers to get a workshop mm -hmm. setting. Okay. So, like the cost on that is. You mean cost for the travel? Sure. Well, typically, typically costs for that are borne by the students who are taking the trip. Okay. Uh, so no cost to the No cost to the No, no, they'll need substitutes. It's on April 25th. Again, that, that cost is worked into the cost of the trip to the students. So the students are going, because this just says staff. It's, it's one staff member taking eight or nine students. Oh, I see. Okay. Okay, two staff members. I'm sorry. <laughs> I'm going to. <laughs> yeah, that, that may need to be modified because it just looks like it's That's senior high staff. Yeah, that's what I thought. And maybe it should be students too. That and students. Yeah, just to clarify. Um. As far as the Act 80 day, um, I don't know if this is this is where we discuss the calendar a little bit, or if that's in a different spot. This is a good time. Okay, I thought so. Um, <clears throat> so I had the opportunity to speak with Dr. Phillips, so a lot of my personal questions are already answered. Um, but and it's, I, when I read this, it said that we were approving um, an Act 80 day for August 23rd. Dr. Phillips, am I correct that we need two Act 80 days, though, for our seniors? We already have two Act 80 days. So this will be a third one? This is a third one that will allow our students to not come in after August 13th. Uh, it, it will allow our seniors, our seniors to graduate on that Friday and not be in a penalty for attendance. So this gives us three Act 80 days? <laughs> yes. And this? For the seniors. Can't they go to the entire student body? Again, when we looked at this schedule, 
what we did was look at what was best for students. And waiving three days of instruction was not something we felt was best for students. Seniors, they're not coming no matter what we do. They're graduating and they're done. Okay. So we use the Act 80 days to cover those. So, but beyond those Act 80 days, I'm assuming there's the two conference days and then, of course, the some service day. Correct? That's what we're using for Act 80? It's the first day back. It's, uh, it's uh, Columbus Day and Martin Luther King Day. Those those in service days. Okay. County is Act 80. Okay. So I've done, uh, tried to do a lot of research and get my um, information straight on Act 80. Um, and after 80 days would be used for the entire student body though. You could just designate it for seniors? They could. So we typically build our calendar with 181 actual student days in it. And instructional days. Instructional days. Right. Um, we sort of use the Act 80 day as a hedge just because um, you know, if we add snow days on beyond graduation, um, then we're always in a we're in a situation where we get fined, then we lose subsidy because the state will uh, request the reimbursement back that we would have earned for attendance for those seniors during that time. Correct. Uh, the law says we have to have students in session 180 days. Mm -hmm. So, so let me interrupt because my question is right there. So if we we have three Act 80 days being used for our seniors. That takes the seniors to, that takes June 8th to be 178 days of they, instruction. They will, they will have 177 plus the three Act 80 days to, okay. 180, to get to 180. So then the rest of the student body that goes till the 13th um, will have 100. Well, they will technically. They will technically have 180 days of instruction. Right. Instructional so, days. instructional days, correct. Yeah, yes, the Act 80 days could be hedged if we wanted to waive attendance Three for those, those students. Um, but I, I think what Dr. Phillips was saying is um, the, other, the other number that comes into play is the 189 contractual days for our staff. So, our bus drivers, our aides, our, our teachers. Uh, so, they all have to be here on those days to equal 189. There is no so four exception. So Correct. we're, you know, the discussion was getting the students to 180 and having, you know, meeting the, the day um, requirement for them. Um, the day requirement of 180, the way that we get, you know, we use this is uh, there's 180 instructional days and of course we build 181 just sort of as a, as a, as a, a hedge against snow and, and whatever. Um, the Act 80 day is, a, is an exception that can be made um, on snow, professional though. development days, right. not for snow. No, I've done a lot of research. It has to be a professional development day, and for you to then convert a PD day to an Act 80 day, which then makes a day of learning, a professional day of learning for our staff, that actually converts it to be used as a, to count for an instructional day against students. Uh, we have to have met the threshold of hours of 900 hours in elementary and 990 in secondary, which we've met. Um, but um, again, we're the, the discussion was to stick with the 180 days. The, th the Thursday, which would have been 181, we are converting to a professional day of learning, so there'll be, there'll be a, a benefit. Uh, Dr. Winters was thinking about some things that we could do with, with all of those folks, aides, bus drivers, teachers. Um, that would be a rare opportunity uh, to use that for that day, and then the flex day from February would get bumped. Sure, and I think we can we can we can announce, if you will, um, the the indication for Thursday is to use them as uh, the uh, active shooter and mental health uh, trainings that the teachers have been asking for. Okay. Okay. Um, so as just a general statement, I think there just needs to be made to the community, to families, you know, that. And I think it's just, it's not common knowledge that students need to be in school for 180 days and by, uh, with all of the snow days that were involved this year, um, we are able to make some adjustments for our seniors, but all students need to go till June 13th to uh, fulfill their 180 instructional days. Is that a correct statement, Dr. Phillips? Yes. Okay. So I get like a, sort of. Um, and so that's fine. Um, I was pretty clear I didn't say sort of. Yes. Okay. okay. 
Um, and what actions are being taken for next year's calendar, for the 2018-19 calendar, to prevent within yes. year revisions? So families can plan accordingly. We sure. don't have these issues arise. So, there you go. Uh, what, what's been going on is we looked at the calendar, and, and again, uh, the, the decisions that we're making are not arbitrary. Uh, they're not decisions that we're just sitting in a room going, well, this looks good, this looks good. Yeah. We are sitting down and looking at what we feel is best for kids. And we looked at every schedule that every other calendar was out there. There's, there's school districts that are getting on paper out May 31st. I remember, Joe, how the heck does this happen? Let's sit down and look at this. They build and act 80 days, they have this, they have that. And then all snow days are added to the end. Those districts are now going to May 8th and using act 80 days. June. I'm sorry, June 8th. Um, we have districts that are going to the 13th in our county. The districts are going to the 12th in the county because they didn't feel the need to waive instructional days. So going into next year, we looked at what issues we had this year. We built our calendar, we're starting earlier. We're finishing if there are the prerequisite amount of snow days that don't push us out we'll be finishing early on a thursday this year for the first time in a while i believe um, we are putting in on paper you will see nine bit snow days so you will know this day this day this day this day this day in, in sequential order um, we did have uh, which i thought was a good uh, discussion with the union leadership i see michelle's yep she's there and uh, we are putting a, uh, a premium on flex days. And what the teachers had said was, if we're gonna put a premium on flex days, don't take our flex days. So that made sense. Well, we remove that as an option. So that will not be touched next year. So February, we, the February, the February date, yeah. yes. So we've looked at everything we can to answer the questions of this year and try to you know, hopefully not get into that what really is the second week of, of June, because I think June 1st might be a Saturday or a Sunday, and then there's the whole week of June, we would graduate on that Thursday, and I think we would need to be into our seventh or eighth snow date to bump into the second week of June. Okay. Um, that's great. I, um, uh, two other things I want to mention. Um, in looking at this year's calendar as well as last year, because obviously, as many of us um, being board members, we didn't approve this year's count, you know, the 2017-18 calendar. We have approved some adjustments and revisions, but um, not any snow days. Um, and policy 803 states that board determines and approves annually the calendar, or approves the calendar annually. So I just wanna make that known that we don't, um, at least to my knowledge, we don't have the level of governance to uh, uh, have to approve revisions if it's already stated in the calendar. And adding those snow days on to the end of the year, is in the 2017-18 calendar. We do bring them to the board so they're aware. Correct. But the last board approved calendar was um, February 21st. So, so there's been changes and we haven't approved this year's calendar yet at all. So um, any Correct. changes since February 21st. Um, I also want to make note then also that uh, as far as the calendar goes, I think it, you know, it, it, as long as your faculty is, you know, your union leadership has approved it and you feel it's best for kids. Um, uh, my a couple concerns is adding more than 181 days, just kind of fail safe, but it sounds like you've added extra snow days up days in there. Um, and uh, as far as the aesthetics of it, when you print it in black and white, you cannot see the color coding, color coding. So it's, that's just, yeah, a very minor issue, but um, I printed black and white mostly, and so it's very difficult to see uh, the distinguishing colors that represent various days off or in service or early dismissals. So I don't know if there's, um, I know you've done a lot of work with it to, based on things we've asked you to do, um, but again, I have one more suggestion. Um, and I think that if people are unhappy about the calendar or days, they need to come to public comments and speak, you know, or give, you know, give your office a call. And would you agree, Dr. Phillips? Well, yes, people are going to be upset. I right. can't you make can't everyone happy. Right. Uh, my next comment would be, uh, we did have a, a forum today at uh, Jackson Wall, and there was a discussion of the half day rather than the two shortened days going forward. Um, Mr. Wegman, we will have to meet with him and discuss that because there's an issue with if we all try to get out a half a day, 
it's not going to be a two and a half day for everybody because we don't have one we have three tiers we don't have one tier mm -hmm. um, the other thing is we want to do uh we do want to have um input from the community and make sure parents understand that the changes that will take place and can adequately prepare for whatever um child care changes or modifications are going to be needed i mean you might have somebody that can be there at two but not be there at 12 30 that kind of thing um, so we've done that and then we've also we just this morning i sat with uh, some of the other uh, superintendents and we discussed uh, again the flexible uh, instruction on snow days that's something we're, we're thinking about there was a look at a three-hour delay that is a real difficult thing to do in, in in the districts our size some small districts can get away with it um, but we are consistently looking at different ways to do things but as far as this year goes there was no way to prepare for what we went through and what we did was again and i know i'm sounding however but what we did was best for kids because we tried to put as much education as we could within the calendar footprint that's why we took away a flex day that's why we had school on um, easter monday but then we ran out of tricks and then it was we had to start adding to the back end sure well and i think um, based on our conversation before your what's best for kids is that those three last days of instruction um june 11th 12th and 13th are instructional days and students are going to be expected to be taking their finals on those days um as well as um learning going on in the other classrooms that they missed on those snow days so um and you know you assured me that the teachers we, know that i've already well. mentioned it at the uh, jackson wall forum that we will be putting a memo out that there's an expectation of instruction to be going on so I feel compelled to say this because I carpool a bunch of 15 year olds around, <laughs> but there's not a great appreciation for your thought around doing the right thing for kids. They're not real happy about the extension of the school. Imagine so neither would I. Neither well, would the I. The seniors are thrilled because they don't have to do it. I, I, I could understand that the kids are thinking that way. If I may, I, you know, I think the other piece that, that is really important, and you know, I know. I think, you know, teachers and even students will say, well, it's the end of the year, it's the last couple of days, you know, we don't get a year, we don't do a whole lot on those days. You know, they're not meaningful. And I always kind of reflect back and think, yes, you know, when I was in high school, like, I looked forward to the summer, because that was vacation, and that was going to the pool, and that was all different kinds of things. But the reality is that that's not all of our kids. And, you know, we have a sizable portion of our children who, like, you know, they dread summer, because they don't get to go on vacation. And you know their home is not a place that is you know peaceful and enjoyable and that kind of thing. So you know even if our kids are only coming for a half a day, the fact that they get to come for a half a day and get a meal and see a teacher's smiling face who cares about them is it, going to mean the world to, to, to some of those kids. And I think we have to be cognizant of that when we you know talk about well you know we, you know we, we won't get a whole lot done those last days. Well yeah you know we're still we're still touching the lives of children and. And that's why we all got into this business to begin with. And so I think I think that's an important piece not to not to lose sight of. And I think we, we also need to, as a board though, this whole situation has made me more aware of approving the 2018-19 calendar and making sure that uh, we're you know board what's best for kids, but also what's best for our taxpayers, bringing back kids for three days, paying for meals, paying for transportation, we have to consider that too. Um, when we could tweak a little bit our act, our, our act 80 days to not bring kids back for those three days, but that's what's best for kids. I, you know, I, I am an educator. I agree with that. I agree that if those three last days are being utilized appropriately and there's a lot of learning to be done yet, then <coughs> so be it. You know, because we didn't pay for those some of those other days when they they weren't buildings weren't running. Although we were kind of paying for other things like snow removal and things like that, right, Jerry? salt trucks i don't have any idea <laughs> um but a lot of you know mm -hmm. uh, people like to compare exeter to other districts and what's going on in their their sister's district or their cousins or whatever um and ultimately you know we approve the calendar annually and we need to make sure that we're comfortable with it specifically this coming calendar um and that uh it is what's best for kids but also what's best for our taxpayers um, to an extent, to an extent, because we're in, we're in for education here. Thank you. Um, before we adjourn, are there any other oh. uh, issues uh, yes. that we want to uh, bring to the board's attention? Um, and speaking about the calendar, uh, we do have a parent forum coming up, and I was just curious what we're going to be discussing, and maybe the community as, as well. 
Well, we did send, I believe the agenda was sent out. We're going to be discussing curriculum. Um, Dr. Winters will be touching on curriculum. We will have conversation from our two coordinators uh, as well as I will be speaking on the career pathways. And then also, um, has administration uh, considered addressing any concerns regarding April 20th, which is another planned national walkout? We've been having the discussion and there's nothing being discussed right now at our building. So we're trying not to provoke an issue by publicizing it. Thanks, Jasmine. Um, <laughs> but we, we have met and we are prepared to move forward if need be, but at this point we're still not seeing any movement whatsoever. Um, we may now. <laughs> are, you, you're being, are you saying I'm being serious? No, she wasn't bringing attention to it. I, I, way that was I, are you saying I'm being it's already, serious? It's already being addressed in other books in Chester School Districts. It's already being, superintendents are already speaking out about it. Um, so, you know, therefore it is being addressed. It might not be directly in your body, but it's being addressed in Brooks schools. And we did, we did speak about it. And right now at this point we haven't. We're, we're prepared if the need be, but at this point we haven't seen any indication. Looking at social media, I mean, everybody in the back, we, we had our meeting. Have we still to this point seen any indication of it on social media? Um, the students were really good in coming forward to us and expressing their feelings on uh, the March 14th. Getting the date right, correct? The walk-in? Yep. Uh, spent a lot of time with that. Um, again, we're not hearing anything to this point, so we're really not... Uh, we talked about should we address it if, if there's not an issue we, we don't want to provoke an issue okay and um i also apologize i used the rest of when we were all discussing about student council and bringing a student onto the board um and i truly believe if we're going to and i'm not sure exactly what was what how that ended so i apologize um but i believe if we're going to bring a student onto the board because the student is living and breathing these policies so is the teacher in the district so I think we need to consider that as well. I'm not saying I'm an advocate for it, but I'm saying if we're going to, there should be a balance as far as that goes. Bringing a student, he also needed the teacher voice. And now we're, you know, potentially mixing being an elected board member uh, versus conflicts of interest. And so I just wanted to bring that up. Any other topics uh, that we want to consider? Dave, could you just give like a 30 second overview of the uh, meeting that we had last night related to the ad hoc transportation? Sure, I'll be glad to, and uh, we've got other members uh, here uh, of that committee that could speak as well. But we did uh, have our first, our very first ad hoc transportation committee meeting last night. It was primarily an organizational meeting, uh, and the agenda was established to kind of provide us with things like timelines responsibilities, um, goals, uh, direction uh, for our administration in terms of the kind of information that we, we need to move forward. Um, you know, some planning uh, and, and uh, it was, so it was, I, I think it was, it was an interesting meeting because it was well attended by our bus drivers. We probably had 20 plus, 20 plus yeah. bus drivers who were in attendance and they were very interested, they were very polite. Uh, they they want to continue to be engaged in, in what's happening and, and the future of transportation in the district. Obviously, um, you know we are not uh, planning on going through this process in a very rapid manner. I think we want to be deliberate. We want to look at every possible option, and ultimately, I think the goal of this committee is to kind of come to the board with a recommendation that reflects the the most um, efficient and um, financially appropriate uh, means of providing transportation for our students uh, and that's that's pretty much how we resolved it yesterday with um, you know not not a decision making meeting obviously but a, a meeting where we're going to move forward with um, bringing in people who are going to help us understand more I think uh, Mr. Wegman is, uh, has been asked to maybe uh, appear at our next meeting I'm not, I'm not sure if that was a surprise for Mr. Wegman or not but we didn't ask him <laughs> it is now. <laughs> yeah. But, you know, part of the discussion was just we, we want to learn more about the operation of the transportation system as it currently exists in, in the district so we can be, you know, as informed as we can in terms of what currently happens. And we also, I think, as the next step, probably anticipate a, a tour of the facility for our committee. Uh, but that's, that's pretty much where we are at this point right now. Anything else from the committee members? 
Twenty third, six thirty. Twenty third, six thirty. In the PD room. Not the thirtieth. <laughs> thirtieth. Yes. Every it's going to be every Monday two weeks. I, I just, I also want to just for the purpose of uh, just informing board members, there is advocacy day in Harrisburg. The SBA has invited all board members to attend. Hunter and I are going to attend. Um, and if anyone else would like to join us, you're certainly welcome. Uh, just need to uh, register in advance. And we'd be glad to carpool with you. Well, that is a good point, though. The facilities meeting has been switched from the 23rd to the 30th due to the transportation. So thank you. Jim. You're welcome. Any other comments for, from our board members? What, what's the date of the parent community forum? 19. Yeah. So I don't. Is it this first? No, it's the 19th. The 19th. The 19th. The 19th. Yeah. Prior to that is the STEM community. Prior to that is the STEM community partnership meeting. Yeah, right there. That was on the 26th. That's the fair. That's the, that's the, that's the STEM fair. fair. That's that's fair. We have a meeting with night. business people that come together to help support the STEM program. Um, so we meet them monthly, give or take. Um, so that meeting will take place prior to the 24th. And then just a reminder for our board members, we do have an executive session following the, uh, the meeting this evening. Uh, if there's no other business, well, We'll adjourn.